you probably know Detroit Diesel for brute force. But in 1957, they built something different. The Compact 253. Designed for tight spots and tough jobs, this tiny engine carried a colossal promise. Yet, instead, it became one of the company's most regrettable missteps, leaving operators with unexpected costs and machines that buckled under pressure. By the mid to late 1950s, industries like agriculture, marine, and construction were changing fast. As machines grew more specialized, operators found themselves needing engines that could handle smaller tasks. Engines that didn't take up much space but could still get the job done. That's where Detroit Diesel saw an opening. They answered with the 253, a two-cylinder diesel with 106 cubic inches of displacement in an inline configuration. It was the smallest engine in the 53 series, a new low end for a family known more for big bruisers than compact diesels. But it still carried the Detroit name, a name associated with rugged, overbuilt engines that hauled freight, powered excavators, and lit up remote job sites for decades. If this engine worked, it would extend that legacy into a new class of equipment. The 253 used a two-stroke cycle like its bigger siblings. There was nothing new or flashy about the design, just a continuation of what Detroit was already known for. Simplicity, high parts compatibility, and easy serviceability. Bore and stroke matched the rest of the 53 series, making the engine easier to manufacture and maintain within the same family of parts. It featured unit fuel injection, where each injector was actuated by a cam-driven plunger, eliminating the need for a standalone injection pump and keeping the system tight and self-contained. Detroit pitched the 253 to operators running small tractors, irrigation pumps, generator sets, and marine auxiliaries. The goal was to give them diesel efficiency and lifespan where gas engines fell short. Marketing focused on simplicity and toughness. Traits that had made Detroit's larger engines fixtures in heavy trucks and industrial equipment. In places like Nebraska and Kansas, where long pipe runs and remote irrigation wells were common, the engine quickly found a foothold. A Kansas operator recalled struggling with small gas engines that overheated, fouled plugs, and burned through fuel on days when downtime wasn't an option. After switching to a 253 powering a centrifugal irrigation pump, the difference was immediate. Easier cold starts, longer intervals between service, and no more worrying about hauling jerry cans of gasoline out to the field. It didn't change the world. It just worked, and that mattered. Marine use was another early stronghold. The engine's compact profile and inline layout made it a good fit in cramped engine rooms on work boats and tugs. For auxiliary power, where a generator or hydraulic pump needed to stay running for hours below deck, the 253 gave operators a known quantity in an unfamiliar footprint. In one account from the Gulf Coast, a shrimper had been jury-rigging gas motors to power his refrigeration system. Once he swapped in a 253 and an appropriate gen head, he ran three seasons straight without touching the setup. No more stalling, vapor lock, or worn-out ignition systems. It didn't make headlines, but for guys like that, it was the kind of change you didn't forget. The small size made it more accessible. Service manuals read the same. Parts bins already had what you needed. And for shops already familiar with other 53 series models. Especially the inline versions, most of what they saw under the covers felt familiar. For all its compatibility and clever packaging, the 253 came with fine print, and for operators who missed it, the engine's quirks would show up fast. From the outside, the 253 looked like a smart move. But once the engine hit the field in bigger numbers, cracks started to show. Not in the form of catastrophic failures, but in the kinds of persistent, frustrating issues that made operators question if they'd made the right call. I think I might have fixed those fuel leaks, but we'll soon find out. One of the first complaints came from the injector linkage. Like the rest of the 53 series, the 253 used a unit injector system, with each injector actuated by a cam-driven plunger. 
That wasn't unusual. Detroit had been doing it for years. But on the two-cylinder version, the margin for error was razor thin. A sloppy linkage adjustment or a worn throttle rod could throw the entire setup out of sync. Operators used to tuning larger Detroits found that the 253 wasn't as forgiving. One cylinder would run lean, the other rich. Misfires, uneven idle, and black smoke at startup became common enough that seasoned mechanics started carrying adjustment tools just to keep the thing balanced. It wasn't that the design was bad, it was just too delicate for what it was supposed to be, a hard-nosed utility motor. Then came the maintenance curve. Detroit's two strokes had a reputation for taking a beating. Long intervals, rebuildable everything, and parts that lasted. But on the 253, those same expectations became a liability. Operators assumed they could run it like a scaled-down 671, but with only two cylinders, any imbalance or problem was much more noticeable, and there was less margin for error. Neglect a seal, and it would leak. Skip a timing check, and it would bark back. An irrigation operator in central Nebraska told of losing pressure mid-season because a head gasket started to seep. It hadn't blown. It just failed quietly, bleeding compression over a couple weeks until the pump couldn't keep up. By the time they tore it down, they found pitting in the liner and uneven wear on the injector tips, all from what amounted to skipped preventive maintenance. The kind of thing that engine was supposed to be immune to. And while you could argue that any engine will punish neglect, the 253 seemed especially sensitive for something marketed as rugged. That disconnect between branding and reality started to frustrate longtime Detroit customers. These were guys who had run eight V71s without touching them for 2,000 hours. Now they were getting bogged down keeping a two-cylinder on its feet. There was also the matter of noise. All Detroit two-strokes have a sound, a mechanical scream that fans love and neighbors don't. But the 253 with just two cylinders firing every revolution had a kind of syncopated clatter that made it feel like it was always working harder than it should. Operators who mounted them on skids or frames often had to reinforce the brackets or add rubber isolators just to keep them from rattling loose. On marine vessels, the problem multiplied. One fishing vessel operator said his below-deck gen set sounded like a bag of wrenches on a tumble cycle. It wasn't just loud, it was exhausting. And then there was the question of output. At roughly 35 to 53 horsepower, depending on configuration, the engine fell into a weird middle ground. Too powerful for applications that could make do with a gas motor, but too weak to compete with rising stars in the small diesel space. Engines like the Perkins 4.108 or the early Kubotas were offering quieter operation, better fuel economy, and easier cold starts, all in similarly sized packages. And unlike Detroit, those engines were often paired with OEM equipment straight from the factory. You didn't have to rig one into place. It was already in your tractor or generator when it rolled off the line. Weight didn't help its case either. The 253 shared the heavy cast-iron DNA of its bigger siblings, which meant it brought real mass to a fight where that wasn't always welcome. Its specs showed that it was heavier than many engines in its class, and for operators trying to stay within frame limits or axle ratings, that was a deal-breaker. It didn't matter how durable it was if it made the machine top-heavy or burn through mounts. None of these flaws were fatal in isolation. The 253 didn't explode or self-destruct. It just quietly failed to win anyone over. It was reliable enough, but not easy enough. It was powerful enough, but not efficient enough. It felt like it was designed for maximum parts compatibility with the big Detroits. But that didn't always translate well to the realities of small engine applications. And so, while Detroit's larger two-strokes roared through the 1960s and 70s in everything from highway trucks to military APCs, the 253 found itself passed over. By the early 1960s, the diesel landscape was changing fast. New names were gaining traction in the low horsepower space, 
And while Detroit Diesel had decades of trust behind it, trust alone wasn't enough to win this fight. Since Kubota and Perkins had already started pushing into U.S. markets with smaller, smoother four-strokes, operators now had a different kind of choice. These engines weren't just alternatives. They solved problems the 253 still carried. They typically ran quieter and, thanks to higher compression ratios and improved fuel systems, started easier. They also tended to leak less oil, especially when new. And unlike the 253, which was seen as a scaled-down member of a big engine family, these engines were purpose-built for small equipment. Gasoline engines had also closed the gap. Electronic ignition and better fuel systems made them more reliable than they had been a decade earlier. For a lot of small jobs, especially intermittent use cases like backup generators or short-run irrigation, gas power started to look like the easier answer. The 253 could last a long time with diligent maintenance, but fewer operators wanted to deal with the extra upkeep. And there was another shift, one Detroit couldn't control. Equipment manufacturers began pre-installing engines from overseas, Perkins and tractors, Deutz and compressors, Onan and Kohler in gensets. Instead of buying an engine and building around it, customers were buying machines that came ready to go. That left the 253 increasingly boxed into aftermarket and retrofit territory, a niche where cost, ease of install, and parts support made all the difference. Detroit had always been strong in dealer support, but for the 253, the energy just wasn't there. Part of the problem was brand fit. Detroit Diesel had built its name on highway haulers and military trucks. When buyers saw Detroit, they pictured 671s tearing up interstates or dozers roaring through job sites. They didn't picture a little two-cylinder spinning a well pump. And when they did, it felt off. The 253 needed a market that accepted the hands-on upkeep, typical of larger Detroits even in a small package. Instead, it landed in a market that was going the other way. Customer expectations had shifted, too. The kind of operator who once rebuilt his own injectors or tuned his own governor was aging out of the workforce. A new generation wanted plug-and-play reliability. Fewer rack adjustments to make and governor springs to tweak. Just flip the switch and get back to work. The 253, with its Detroit roots, still expected you to earn its respect. Internally, even Detroit seemed to realize it wasn't worth the push. While the rest of the 53 series, especially the 353 and 6V53, stayed in circulation, support for the two-cylinder version faded over time. That quiet retreat was maybe the biggest mark against it. When it came time to bet on an engine, even Detroit didn't pick the 253. And for a company that prided itself on making the toughest engines in America, that silence said everything. On paper, the 253 failed. It didn't redefine small diesel power, didn't capture market share, and didn't influence design trends of the time. It was pulled quietly, unsupported by marketing or dealer enthusiasm. For most companies, that would be the end of the story. But in this case, the engine's failure was significant because of what it exposed. The issues that it uncovered ended up reshaping Detroit Diesel. When the 253 disappeared, it left a visible hole in their lineup, a low-end vacuum that the company wouldn't fill for nearly two decades. In that time, competitors like Perkins, Kubota, and Mitsubishi didn't just offer small diesels. They shaped how the world thought about them. Compact, quiet, fuel-efficient, and like we said, plug-and-play. The standard was set without Detroit in the conversation, and for a while the company didn't fight back. The V-Block two-strokes carried the brand through the 70s and 80s. Power in, noise out. Modular, yes, but not quiet or refined enough for the new generation of small equipment. If you needed 200 to 400 horsepower, Detroit had a solution. But below that, the 253 had scared them off. The company simply wasn't interested in re-entering that space. Not yet. Internally, the 253 had done damage. 
It had revealed something deeper than a bad engine fit. It had exposed a philosophy problem. Detroit had assumed its big engine DNA could be scaled down without consequences. That operators and smaller equipment would accept the quirks of unit injection, the noise, the weight, the maintenance curve. That all users cared about was longevity. They were wrong. That reckoning took years to translate into a new product. But by the late 1980s, something changed. Diesel markets were shifting again. This time toward urban transit, vocational trucks, and OEM integrated applications. Detroit couldn't just scale up old designs or retrofit highway engines into buses. This new generation of equipment needed engines built from scratch to meet exact needs. Cleaner, quieter, easier to install, and far more electronically integrated. And that's where the Series 50 and 60 came in. And where the 253's failure mattered. Launched in the late 1980s and early 1990s, the Series 50 and Series 60 weren't tweaks. They were philosophical resets. Both were four-stroke, electronically controlled, and modular by design. No more scavenging blowers, no more mechanical racks. The Series 60, in particular, became a legendary platform in highway transport. Not just because of its performance, but because of how it integrated into OEM applications. The same engine that powered a Freightliner could also work in a bus, with seamless ECU control and fleet standard diagnostics. The mistakes of the 253 rigidity, poor packaging, and brand mismatch weren't repeated. If anything, they were aggressively avoided, and it wasn't just about electronics. Detroit's later engines were built with actual end-user diversity in mind. You could spec different horsepower bands, emissions configurations, and even cooling setups all from the same basic block. That kind of configurability was missing from the 253 era, where you either took what Detroit gave you or made it work yourself. Was this change solely because of the 253? Probably not. But the 253 was the last time Detroit tried to enter a segment it didn't understand, and failed for reasons that went far beyond hardware. When they returned to smaller engines in the late 20th century, they didn't lead with muscle. They led with fit, integration, and adaptability. That shift continues today. When Detroit, now part of Daimler Truck, designs modern engines, the focus isn't just on torque curves and rebuild intervals. It's on uptime, software compatibility, and application targeting. In that world, the 253 looks like a fossil, but it's a reminder of what happens when engineering brilliance forgets who it's supposed to serve. <laughs>